Throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel had many ways in which they expressed their worship of God. Of course, they had their sacrifices, but they also loved to sing songs of praise. Miriam sang in response to God's saving hand after Israel had passed through the Red Sea. Deborah and Barak celebrated their triumph in song. David was received with song by the women of Israel after his victory over Goliath. And there were songs of celebration and praise to God as David had the ark brought to Jerusalem by the Levites. So you see, singing was very common in Israel. But what happens when the songs of praise and worship of God are interrupted by the Babylonian captivity? What songs can you sing when you're in slavery? Well, our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to deal with this issue as he takes us to Psalm 137. He titled his sermon, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. Dr. McGee first gave this sermon during his 21 years as a pastor at the Church of the Open Door when it was in downtown Los Angeles. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with songs of joy, regardless of our circumstances. Keep our eyes focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Perhaps some of you can recall that in the old days, at a railroad crossing, there was always an upright with two crossbars, and on that it was stop, look, listen. And you feel like putting that sign up as you come to this psalm here. And I'd like to look at that stop, look, and listen before we get into the psalm, and I'd begin actually at the last one, which is listen. And we need to say that this psalm is one of the historical psalms, which is unusual. Uh, The historical books of the Old Testament do not record the history of the nation Israel during the 70 years' captivity that they were in Babylon. There's no record of that captivity at all. It's true that Jeremiah prophesied about it, but he did not go with the captives. Ezekiel was with them, and you can only draw by inference the condition of the captives from his message. And Daniel prophesied during that period, but he was in the court of the world ruler, and his ministry was directed there, and we have no word from him at all concerning these people. In other words, there is a hiatus, a wide gap that's a void and a vacuum as far as the Word of God is concerned. Then after the 70 years, you pick up the historical books again that give detail, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. They pick up the story when they return to the land. Now, this psalm, it does just that. It enables us to see the captives as they were in the land of Babylon. And so we put over this look because we can look through the keyhole at their tragic plight. For all this psalm is is just a little keyhole that we can see them. It gives us a bird's-eye view of their hopeless life in captivity. It records their tragic yet tender experience, their bitter hatred yet deep love. And you can put your ear to the door of this psalm, and you can hear the sob of their soul. And then the other would be to look. And in verse 4... Here is a question. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, Look at that. And if you'll take a good look at it, you'll realize that this is a question that has no answer. And there are a great many questions in this life that are like that. They have no answer. How can you sing the Lord's song in a strange land. If you have the answer to that, I'd like to have it. Now, will you notice the third uh, that we look at as we come to this crossing? We not only have listen, we not only have look, but stop. This is a stop, too. This is also known as an imprecatory psalm. 
and that is a prayer, a wish for vengeance. Will you notice? Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stone. And may I say to you, it'd be very easy to detour around this psalm and preach for a hundred years and never have to preach on it. Just forget about it. And I'm afraid that a great deal of scriptures detoured around today for that reason. But there are three explanations. There is the explanation of higher criticism. And their explanation, they uh, appear to be the intelligentsia, at least they claim that, and yet they take the most naive explanation of all. They just reject it. Forget all about it. doesn't belong in the Bible. May I say to you, it's very easy to take that type of a position, but uh, you can't d dismiss it like that. It's like the simple-minded fella in the country who bought a cow. He learned after he bought the cow that it cost something to feed the front end of the cow, but he got the milk from the back end of the cow, and he decided to concentrate on the back end of the cow, forget about the front end of the cow, he'd make more money. May I say to you, you know what happened, his cow died. But he was a higher critic. You take what you like and you reject that which you do not like. May I say that that's not being intellectual at all. Then there is the viewpoint of the fundamentalist who says, I believe the Bible from cover to cover, but he's never read it. And uh, he, uh, well, today we fundamentalists are called anti-intellectual. And may I say that that's true in many cases. I'm amazed today at the ignorance of the Bible among laymen. There's more than one way of denying the Word of God, friends. You don't have to get on a street corner and get a soapbox to deny the Word of God. You can merely act like it, it's not the Word of God. And if you want a very practical test, it may hurt. May I say the test is this? Do you spend more time with the Los Angeles Times than you do with the Word of God? Then, my friend, may I say that you are acting as if it's not the Word of God. May I say to you, just merely act as if it's not the Word of God. And if this is the Word of God, then Psalm 137 should be considered. And the third approach is to believe it and attempt to determine the meaning of the psalm. And that's what we want to do, is to determine the meaning of the psalm. And with that objective in view, let's look at the psalm. Now, we have attempted to take the psalm and divide it in a mechanical sort of way into three different parts, because it records the experience of these people in captivity. In the first two verses, you have the central experience of these people. In verses 3 and 4, you have the critical experience of these people. And then from verses 5 through 9, you have the crowning experience of these people that were in captivity. Now, will you notice that the central experience now, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. The locale of this psalm is by the rivers of Babylon. Actually, I think it's the canals of Babylon. They were settled there when they were taken into captivity. They were colonized, and they were put there. They are now out of the land, and when they are out of the land, they're always in trouble all the way from the land of Goshen to the ghettos of Europe, all the way from the brickyards of Egypt to Babylonian captivity. When they're out of the land, they're in deep trouble. All the way from the slave labor camps of the Nazi and Dachau and other places to back of the Iron Curtain today under communism, these people know what it is to suffer by the rivers of Babylon. That's where they are. And the question is, 
What are they doing there? Well, they're out of the promised land. And they say, there we sat down. And that speaks of the deep dejection, the despair, the despondency, the dire and desperate desolation of these people. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, they are wo woe-begone folk here. And in the book of Psalms, this is an unusual one, because the Psalms are songs of praise and of joy. But not this one. This one they throw in the crying towel. It's a contrast that they make here between Babylon and Jerusalem. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion was back there in the hill country, those beautiful hills, and Jerusalem was a city set upon a hill. But Babylon is down in the flat country, no hill down there. In fact, one king of Babylon married a girl from the hill country. She must have been a hillbilly. And she was unhappy down there. You'd have to be raised in the hill country and have to live down in that flat land. And uh, the king wanted to make her happy, and he built her a mountain inside of the city. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. He wanted to make her happy, but there's nobody to build these folk any hanging gardens at all. If there's any building to be done, They'll do the building, but they'll not put anything up. They'll be digging down. They're digging more canals. May I say they are there? And why are they there? They're there because they've sinned. And if you want to listen to another one, let me turn to Jeremiah 9, verses 1 and 2. Here's another crybaby. Jeremiah was, had the heart of a woman. Uh, God took a man with a tender heart to deliver the harshest message. But you listen to him because he lived during this period and he saw what happened to his people. He saw them go into captivity. He says, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. That's his condition. But listen, oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. And their adultery is, of course, spiritual adultery. They had gone into idolatry. They had turned from the living and true God. And Jeremiah said, I weep for them. I love them, but I don't want to be in their midst. I want to get away from them because of their idolatry and because of their sin. Now, that's the reason that they're down by the rivers of Babylon. That's the reason that they're weeping down there. Now, will you notice? We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. They had no heart for singing in Babylon. We today think of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. The first Wailing Wall was in Babylon. That's where they first started wailing. And you can hear them crying down there. They said, we cannot sing the Lord's song by the rivers of Babylon. That's no place to sing. Out of the will, will of God, they hang their hearts. And that, by the way, is the instruments of praise. May I say to you today, this is something that is very noticeable in this hour, and that is that there's a sadness in our churches. I've talked this with several preachers across this country today, all the way from Florida to Canada and to the West Coast and East Coast. And I don't care where you go today, there's a sadness in the church. In good churches, it ought not to be there. And there are multitudes of Christians today that have hanged their hearts on a willow tree, and they're no longer 
no longer today rejoicing in the Lord. But they've got a harp, and they're harping on something, I can assure you. Now, they are criticizing. They're finding fault. They today find nothing to praise God for and to be thankful for. As I move on from this, may I ask you a personal question? Have you lost your song? Is your harp hanging on a willow tree? Really today, is there the joy of the Lord in your heart? May I say to you, that's the central experience of these people. It's where they are, by the rivers of Babylon. Now will you notice their critical experience that is here? For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Now, down in Babylon, the Grey Line Tours, they ran a tour out to the, for the people to see these captives that heard about them, and they ran a tour out there. Babylon didn't have a Disneyland. In fact, the whole city was a Disneyland there, and they therefore didn't have a tour there. But they made a tour uh, out to see these captives. And these people of Babylon, they came out, and they, they rather sneered as they looked at them. They required of us a song. And uh, they that wasted us said, Heist a tune. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. We've heard about you people. Now, the temple in Jerusalem had become world famous at this time. God intended it to be that way. You see, the nation Israel witnessed differently than we witnessed. They were, they were told never to go out to the world as missionaries. You can sympathize with Jonah. Jonah could very easily say to the Lord, Look, Lord, you never asked Isaiah to do this. And you never ask any of the other prophets to do this. I'd rather stay home. And I don't care for the Assyrians anyway. And I say to you, it was unusual that God sent Jonah out because the invitation of the Old Testament is, Come, let us go up to Jerusalem and to the house of the Lord. And they faced in always. And as they were true to God and faced in, they witnessed to a lost world. And you want to know whether they were effective or not? The Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth, and if you'll read on in that passage, you'll find that all the kings of the world of that day came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Why? That wisdom was in that temple. And if you'd been in Jerusalem at, the, at any one of the feasts that we have mentioned, when literally there were several hundred thousand people there, you'd have heard something that would have thrilled your heart. In fact, you would have heard music the like of which hasn't been heard this side of heaven. You would have heard these people singing the songs of Zion. And travelers over the years had come to Jerusalem. They had heard them and went back and reported. And it was known throughout the world. On that feast day, the Levites were divided into two groups. There was an orchestra. And I'll be honest with you, I'm of the opinion that orchestra went somewhere around a thousand. That's a pretty big orchestra. We can't even get 15 here. But they had a thousand. And then they had several thousand of the Levites in a trained choir. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, took care of that. And beside that, there was the great company of people probably in that temple area. And I estimated that you could get 200,000 people in the temple area, and it was larger in that day. Been whittled down since then. And they would come in there, and you could hear them singing one of these songs. God, what praise. The whole world said, we want to hear it. And these people have been, they've been musicians friends, down through the year. They've been musicians. There was Maya Beer, Offenbach, 
Fritz Chrysler, George Gerswin, Felix Mandelson, and Paul Whiteman, Irvin Berlin, all Jews, not counting Jack Benny. May I say to you, they are musicians. They have produced great musicians. They had, they had great music. David was an outstanding musician. May I say to you what a thrill it was to have been there and heard them. But, but they can't sing the Lord's song in a strange land. That's their statement. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I don't have the answer for them. May I say to you, these people, though, that came out, they came out to hear, what, when they got there, what did they find? The harps are on the willows, and they are sitting down in deep dejection, and they said, you mean to tell me you're the musicians? You're the folk who sing praises to God? <laughs> what a joke. How ridiculous it is to look at you. May I say to you, it was sad, was it not? And I think they turned around and said, we're going back to Babylon. We'd much rather hear the Babylonian beetles. We'd rather hear them sing, smog gets in your eyes, or some such song as that, than to listen to you. And maybe that's one of the reasons today the world has turned from the music of the church. Difficult to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. But the very interesting thing is Christians are to sing in a strange land. The very opposite of these, because we're told to go out. They were told to come in. We are told to go to the ends of the earth. And Peter says that you're strangers and pilgrims in the earth. And you're to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. That's the only place we can sing it. But uh, why is it today that people have lost their song? May I mention three things? There is today a natural tendency of some folk. Let's say it's psychological. It, they have a pessimistic outlook on life not very bright. A lot of people are naturally that way. They are made up that way. They are filled with melancholy all the time. And uh, they're not a happy folk. Uh, frankly, I'm of the opinion that we don't need to smile all the time. I, I never did quite buy during the Youth for Christ days the you, the song leaders who insisted that you'd always smile for about uh, five years. I was out every Saturday night uh, uh, across this country at those meetings. I learned. I learned fast. The song leader always, and they did it everywhere, and they did it the same way. They said, now everybody smile. And then they'd turn around and always say to the folk on the platform, you smile. Are you fellas smiling this morning? Uh, may I say to you that and I developed what I call the Youth for Christ smile. It's a very artificial sort of thing. You know, you come out with it like that, you know. I don't think you have to have that. Uh, I think some people are naturally. They're, they're just not a happy folk, psychologically made up that way. And I think that we need to recognize that. And then there is a second reason, and... There are folk that have been buffeted by life, discouragements and disappointments. I have noticed in many places a sad face. The other day up in the state of Washington at the conference up there, there was a woman sitting in that uh, congregation in that tabernacle, had one of the saddest faces I've ever seen. I said to the director afterward, I said, do you know her? Oh, yes, he said. He said, she has a very sad story. And he told it. And I want to tell you, if I'd been through what she'd been through, I'd have the same kind of a face. May I say to you that a great many people today, 
The fardels and errors of outraged fortune have borne in upon them, and they're unhappy. And that's a reason today. And then the third, and this is the place, though, where something can be done about it. There are many Christians today with sin in their lives, and you can't be happy. You can't have a song if there's sin in your life. Oh, you can go through the mechanics of it, and you may be able to carry the tune, but it's not in your heart. And you can't have it, my friend, when there's sin in your life. You remember David, after his awful sin, he went in in confession, Psalm 51, and in that he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now, he never did lose his salvation, but he sure did lose the joy of it. He lost all the fun. He thought it would be fun, but it wasn't. He lost his song. And it said of the Lord Jesus, somebody's going to say, well, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Of course he was. But whose sorrows were they? And whose grief was it? Surely he hath borne our sorrows, and he hath carried our grief. Our sin was put upon him. And did you expect him to laugh about that? But it was for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and despised the shame. May I say to you, he had no sorrow, no sin of his own, and there was no sorrow. He was the happy, joyful Christ. But when your sin and mine was put upon him, that was not a pleasant experience. Sin today takes away the song. And these people are by the rivers of Babylon because of sin. They can't sing. How can they sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And how can the Christian today rejoice when there's sin in his life? He cannot. Now there's the crowning experience here. Will you notice this? Let me read verse 5. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. This is the man who went as a pilgrim to Jerusalem. And he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But he can't go there now. He's a slave. He is in a foreign land. He can't sing. But thank God, there is repentance. He said, I'll never forget you, Jerusalem. That's the ray of hope, and then there is his pledge of allegiance, that now he will obey God, that he wants to be back in the will of God and to obey God. He's saying, oh, if I could only go back to Jerusalem. This is his confession. Oh, my friend, listen to him now. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation of it. He's crying now for justice. Who's Edom? Edom was his brother. He's the Arab today. The Edomites across the Jordan River on the east bank of the Dead Sea They heard the Babylonians were coming. Babylonians didn't worry about Edom because Edom had sunk down at this period, but also you couldn't capture that rock-hewn city of Petra. They let it alone. And so they they took Jerusalem. And so the Edomites got in a cheering section. They said, uh, they said, uh, uh, let's give 15 for the Babylonians. Uh, They urged them on, touch down, touch down. We want you to get in there and destroy Jerusalem. And then when one of the captives would slip away and hide, the Edomites say, there he is. They were traitors of the worst kind. 
They were quizzling. That was the Edomite. And now he says to the Lord, Remember him, O God. And then there are those that criticize him for that. May I say to you, this is a cry for justice. But it says, but this is not the Christian spirit who said it was. May I say to you, it's not the Christian spirit. These people are under law, not under grace. Our Lord on the cross said, Father, forgive them. And all he asked at that time was of the particular sin of crucifying him. That would have been an unpardonable sin had he not made that statement. But will you notice Stephen followed it up and before they stoned him, he said, Father, forgive them. And we say that's the Christian spirit. And I must confess that it is. That is the Christian spirit. But I wonder today if we do have a correct viewpoint of this. It's led us today. Liberalism has led us down a dead-end trail. And today our nation finds itself in a very difficult situation because we've attempted to follow philosophy that I'm confident God does not intend for us to follow. Is it wrong to ask for justice? Is it wrong today to ask that things be made right? Will you listen to Paul as he writes to the Romans? In Romans 12, 19, when he tells about the relationship with different folks, now he said, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now somebody says the Christian then is not to take revenge. Right, he's not. Then we forget it. Oh, no, God didn't say forget it. God says, look, I've asked you to walk by faith. I intend to straighten out everything in this world. And I wouldn't have that job that God's got for anything in the world. Just think of the things that are wrong in this world and have been for 5,000 years, and he's going to straighten every one of them out. And only God could do that. And he's going to straighten it out. He says that. God has determined that he's going to straighten the world out. That's his plan. That's his purpose. You may not like it, but he's going to straighten it out. Now he says to the believer, you trust me to work it out. And to begin with, you do not know what justice is. You don't know all the facts. I do, and I intend Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll straighten it out. And you forsake the pathway of faith when you take it in your own hands. Trust me and walk like that. This idea today that we forget these things, no, sir. And I think a child of God has the right to pray that justice be brought in this world. And then they tell me, well, this is actually, this is not the the Christian spirit at all. May I say to you, are you sure about that? In the Revelation, in the sixth chapter, listen to this. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. You say that's contrary to the spirit of the New Testament? It is not. Justice must prevail if there's a God in the heaven. And by the way, all of this talk today by these folks that are talking about turning the other cheek, may I say it to you, how deeply do you feel about evil? The one who's coming to reign someday, it says that he loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. In Psalm 45, verse 7, you can't love the right without hating the wrong. It'd be impossible. If you saw a mad dog come into your yard where your child is playing, what would you do with the mad dog? You'd shoot him, wouldn't you? Don't you hate mad dogs when they're about ready to bite your child? 
And why? Because you love your child. My friend, if you don't do something about the mad dog, I don't think you love your child when he comes. He will love righteousness. He will hate wickedness. May I say to you, you have here, therefore, the law of retribution. Listen to him now as he thought of how Edom had so betrayed them. Now he thinks of the, what really happened when Babylon came. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed? Happy shall he be that rewardest thee as thou hast served us. And uh, there are those that say, well, you don't really mean that, that he's asking for God to destroy Babylon. He doesn't have to ask. He merely says God's going to destroy it. And God did destroy it. Now we come to this verse that really presents the problem here, and it is verse 9. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stone. Now you know why God said to Jeremiah, I do not want you to marry and raise children in this city. Terrible time is coming. Our Lord says for the great tribulation period, Woe unto them that are with child and those that give suck in those days. The, the worst casualties of war have always been the little children. And God is thinking of the little children. He said, Jeremiah, don't bring them into the world. The false prophet said, go ahead, bring them in. Nothing's going to happen to Jerusalem. But it did happen, and the brutal Babylonians came, and they destroyed the city. Not only did they destroy the city, they had take a child, a baby out of the arms of its mother, and then take it by the heels and dash it against the ground. That's on record. There's something else on record, whether you like it or not. Humphrey Prido records this from history. In the beginning of the fifth year of Darius happened the revolt of the Babylonians, which caused him the trouble of a tedious siege again to reduce them. He besieged this city with all his forces. As soon as the Babylonians saw themselves begirt by such an army, as they could not cope with in the field, they turned their thoughts wholly to the supporting of themselves in the siege. In order whereto they took a resolution, the most desperate and barbarous that ever any nation practiced, until, of course, the Nazis. For to make their provisions last the longer, they agreed to cut off all unnecessary mouths among them, and therefore, drawing together all the women and children, they strangled them all, whether wives, sisters, daughters, or young children, useless for the wars, excepting only that every man was allowed to save one of his wives, which he best loved, and a maidservant to do the work of the house. Brutal and terrible. God said, And whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, is this psalm for the dark ages? Have we today grown more civilized and loving? Right now we have the instruments of war and they are being used that would make the Babylonians look like rover boys. Men thought so, and they're beginning now to change their mind. Liberal theology said so. Psychology confirmed it, that there's good in man, and we've come to the place today where we've outgrown that. They thought men could bring in an era of peace. They could sit down at the United Nations and resolve all their problems. President de Gaulle thought so. The Democrats and Republicans thought so. College professors thought so and taught so. Students marched because they believed it was so. And the dove that had been confined to the kitchen began to fly in classrooms, halls of justice, legislative halls. 
The dream is over. The Word of God says, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, because God knows the human heart lots better than the psychology. In this strange land of sin in which we live today, we ought to have a song. You know what that song is? That's the song of the one who said, I am the doer. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That's the faith and freedom he talked about in this age. If we come to him in simple faith, then he gives a freedom. If the Son make you free, ye shall be free indeed. A freedom from sin, a freedom that the world cannot give nor does it give today. Our song is, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's the table of salvation. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. My cup runneth over. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And on the pilgrim pathway, we are on the way home. We are on the way home. For surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's my home. We are on the way. That's our song along the pilgrim pathway today. What kind of song are you singing today? Is it a song of praise for the salvation that God has given you? If not, would you like to sing that song? Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you to his side. He's waiting for you to respond to him and receive the gift of salvation that he's offering so that you can sing a new song, a song of praise, a song of his great salvation. If you'd like to receive more information on God's plan of salvation for your life, then give us a call right now and request our salvation packet. You can reach us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Today's sermon was titled, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land, and it's available on a single CD. For ordering information, call one of our helpful service operators at 1-800-652-4253, Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. On our weekday broadcast of Through the Bible, we'll be continuing Dr. McGee's excellent study on the book of Psalms. We encourage you to join us every Monday through Friday to gain more insights in the Word of God as you follow along. If you'd like to be added to our mailing list for notes and outlines and our monthly newsletter, contact us by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE using our Internet order form or downloading them from our website at ttb.org. Or, of course, you can always write to Sunday Sermon. For those in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace. Jesus came home, to be my home. Sin had left a crimson shade. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.